Lord, we want to thank you for your gracious, uh, your graciousness, Lord, for your word. Lord, we pray that you be with us in the study tonight. Um, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So for those of you guys that haven't been here, um, we are going through Pilgrim Theology by Michael Horton on Tuesdays. Um, after preaching James on Tuesdays, my heart couldn't take anymore. <laughs> so uh, um, decided to walk through some theology. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take us to walk through this book. I thought it was going to be about, you know, 29 weeks. Yeah. I was wrong because we're starting the attributes of God today. <clears throat> and I was like, we're going to get through six attributes of God. No, we're not. We're going to get through two. Maybe. Maybe. <clears throat> the thing about it is, is that God unfolds who he is through the drama of the scripture. Through the stories of who God is, he reveals his character, he reveals his witness, he reveals everything about himself. We get to see the way that he operates still in the way that he operates with Israel, in the way that he operates with um, the church, the way that he interacts, we get to see how it all unfolds through the story of Scripture. Before I uh, ever read the Bible, I thought the Bible was just a list of this is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. Um, I, and I was like, this is a, a big book of do's and don'ts. And I was like, I don't think I want to do it. And then as... As you open it up and you start to see what it is and how God is unfolding a story. It's a story of redemption. The Bible is a story of redemption. It's a story of, of how God created this world. The people that he placed in his world fell, went against his only commands, brought in sin, and then how God redeems. So, um, there's the whole point is pointing to the cross, which we celebrate the sacrifice of Christ on the cross on Friday. And then Sunday morning, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, where he conquers sin and he conquers death. But there's a whole lot that led up to these events. And, and, and in these events, and as they unfold with creation and Abraham, and, and Abraham and Isaac being a picture of of. God sacrificing his own son. There's a, it was a shadow, it was a type of what was to come. And you get to see the beauty of, of God unfolding in the story of Scripture. Um, when I, God started to open my eyes to, to it, it just changed the whole Bible. It just absolutely changed the Bible. So, the way Michael Horton starts, and, and I, I kind of like this, is using the example of Pharaoh and Moses. Moses went to Pharaoh. Let my people go. You know, it's after, after God showed up in a burning bush that was never consumed. But we get to see some of the attributes of God start to unfold in the story of Pharaoh. Although Pharaoh would not let the Israelites go, he, he, he just didn't. But in, in, in Exodus 4, why? It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He, he told Moses, go to Pharaoh, tell him to let your people go, but he's not going to do it because I will harden his heart. And then Pharaoh hardened his heart even more after that. It, 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 was, it was an act of God. And we see, but we see divine intervention in this. We see, we see how God's sovereignty yes, over the situation really starts to unfold. Because even though Pharaoh had control of the people, he had control of the people because God allowed him to control the people. He was being an, uh, uh, an executor of God's will at the time. There is a false view of sovereignty that a lot, a lot of people hold to that I've seen actually pop up a, a little bit. It, it's come through 
in in set free a little bit. Maybe not in these specific words, but <clears throat> there's people that will say that God is in charge, but he's not in control. And there's a belief that God's authority will never interfere with man's will. That's false. Yes, sir. Because if God does not interfere in our will, right. we'll never be saved. That's right. If God doesn't interfere and intervene with man, our hearts will never be any different. A man cannot and will not be saved of his own of his own will. Uh, John 1 says, uh, I think it was John 1. It's not in there. It's just something that's popping in my head right now. Yeah. So you got to get on it, Bobby. You need, you need to know these things before I do. John 1, 12 says, But to all who, who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but... Of God, right? Not born of, we're not born again of our will, but of God's will. That's right. So, but as the drama, because remember, remember what some of you guys might remember, but the drama of the Word, the story of the Bible as it unfolds, leads us to the doctrine, which is the theology, the the, the thought process, the beliefs in God. That those lead to that, and then the the doctrine leads to doxology, which is praise to God, which is our ascension to God, which is knowing God, which is loving God, which is giving glory and praise and honor to God, which then leads to what? It leads to discipleship, where the Word of God changes our hearts. It transforms us from inside. It transforms who we are. So the story is the drama unfolds. We get to know who God is. We get to know the attributes of God, which are the doctrine. And that leads us to praise and worship because when you rightly understand the attributes of God, how can you not praise? Amen. Amen. And all that leads us to a changed heart, a changed life, God's work. <clears throat> God's attributes show his character and how he interacts with his people. The way he operates is on display because this is who he is. I'm going I'm to uh, throw some scriptures up there. Um, Romans 1.20 says, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. His invisible attributes. Who he is as creator can be seen all the way around us. We can see his divinity, his sovereignty, just working out in a loved one being saved or a loved one coming, you know, a loved one coming to faith. I can see him working things out just in my life. If, if <coughs> trust me, if he can work in my life, he can work in anybody's life. Amen. Um, that's for real. First Timothy one seventeen says that he is immortal invisible, the only God. There's a lot right there. He's immortal, he's invisible, he's the only God. John 4, 24 says that he is spirit. So, so you, see, you start seeing how, how, how things start to unfold and we start to get a picture of who God is. 1 Timothy 6, I think it's supposed to be 15 and 16, um, but I put 16 and 16. Yeah, so... He's the only sovereign king, sovereign king of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, Amen. who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. That's awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> but God's attributes are, are divided into two categories. Attributes of God. We have incommunicable. Dang it. <laughs> and communicable. <laughs> I 
We know about communicable diseases, right? Yes, they can be shared. Amen. Thanks, Ms. Brown. I knew you would have an answer for that. The incommunicable attributes of God are, are those that, that belong to Him and Him alone. We're only going to go over two of them. We're only going to go into this, but I'm going to give just kind of a, 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 an overview. So, where are they at? <coughs> Apparently, I didn't. So, simplicity, a seity, and I'll explain these as, as we get there. <coughs> oh, I can hold this thing, right? Eternal. This is definitely not going to be all of them. Immutable. <coughs> uh, impassibility. This is the one that that is coming up that is causing us to only go over two things today. Because the, when we go over impassibility, it's going to be it's going to be complicated. No, really, I can simplify it. It means that God doesn't change his mind based upon emotions. Like a man. Yeah, but there's a, there's a lot that goes into that. So and then so then the communicable attributes would be stuff like goodness, love, holiness, knowledge, <coughs> wisdom, Righteousness, I do the best you can to read my handwriting. I get it. I'm terrible. Incommunicable, incommunicable attributes are not, are the things that that God alone has. They're not things that they're not attributes that He passes on to us. The Spirit doesn't work in our life to to give us these attributes. These are these are for Him and Him alone. But they work together. All together for His glory and for our good. Amen. So, so it's really important that that God is like this. The communicable attributes are shared with us. They're the things that 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 pass that God passes on to us. So, goodness, goodness is something that we did not have in and of ourselves. In the world, most of us were not good. Uh, most of us still are not good. Amen. Love. I mean. How many of you guys really knew how to love before you knew God? That's right. That's good. We, it takes God. God to show us how to love. Wisdom. Knowledge. Obviously the knowledge of God comes from God. Wisdom comes from walking out in that knowledge and, and learning to, to walk in the ways of God because of the knowledge of God. Righteousness is only given to us by God. So, simplicity. Simplicity of God. I'm going to go back over here. It means unity. That God is not divided. It's simple. He's simple in the fact, not not in the way that we think of simple. Is like, yo, Billy, uh, he's, he's a little simple guy. <laughs> simple means just in that his attributes are not divided in him. So, so what that means is that you can't separate God's love from God's justice. He's unified in that. You can't separate the 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 knowledge of God. And the wisdom of God from his immutability and his impassibility, all those things work together to, to be God for for God. We can't we can't take one attribute <clears throat> over another attribute and say that this attribute of God is way more important than any of these other attributes. <clears throat> because they all work together to make God who he is. 
but they're different still. His attributes are different. Love is not the same thing as justice, right? It, it, it's, it's separate. Lo love manifested in a life is different than justice manifested in a life, even though they work together for God working things out in our life. Because if God loves us, His justice is going to reign in our life. He's going to hold us accountable because of His love. Holiness and omniscience are two, two different ends of the spectrum. But they're distinct. They're, di they're distinct, but they make up who God is. I don't know we're, if we're going to get into it, really. I haven't read that far ahead in the book. <clears throat> but we get to know God and, and His character by His attributes. By the way that He operates in throughout history, the way that He operates with His people, the way that He has poured out His Word, we get to know Him. Another way that we get to know about God and His attributes are through the names. In, in Hebrew, the names meant a lot. So, so uh, the Yahweh, Right, Y H W H. Yeah. It's it's we a lot of times we say Jehovah, is means the Lord. Is it's I am that I am, Yahweh. So that means a lot. So when you get into to to know who God is, you you get to like Jehovah Nisi, and I can't remember what Nisi means. Does anybody remember what Nisi? No, that that's is that. Oh yeah. The Lord provides. Yeah, Jehovah, Jireh. Jehovah Jireh is. Jireh is provide, wow. Nisi is banner. Yes, banner. So our strength is, is the Lord. There's uh, Sid Canoe, there's uh, Jehovah, there's all these things. And, and what it does is it describes who God is by his names so that we get to know his attributes and how he works in lives. Because. The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi, means that He is my strength, He is my shield, He is who He is for me. <clears throat> His attributes are separate but equal. Um, I've never heard of this guy, but I'm, I'm, this quote is Gregory of Nyssa, whatever the, whoever that is. He says, for all the divine attributes, whether named or conceived, are of one of like rank with one another, which basically means they're of equal. His love is equal with his justice. His holiness is equal with his omniscience. His omnipresence is equal with the, not one thing reigns above another. So, so this is important because when you get into some different theological um, groups, and I'm, I'm going I'm to use two extreme examples: hyper Calvinism which is heresy, hyper-Calvinism. Calvinism is not, hyper-Calvinism is. There's a difference between them. Arminianism is on the other side of that. I'm not gonna call Arminianism heresy, because I don't think it is. So I have a different understanding of how God works. <clears throat> so in hyper-Calvinism, they'll lean more focusing on God's sovereignty and God's justice over love. Um, the, the heart of hyper-Calvinism is basically we don't have to do anything because God's in control and He just does everything. It's good. And, and that, that misses out on, on who God is because God changes our lives and I believe He is absolutely sovereign over our lives and but that also causes us to do things in gratitude for him. That's right. Gratitude of what he's done. <clears throat> A lot of times in Arminianism, love is the only focus. People only focus on the love of God. They only focus on grace of God. They only focus on all these things of God. And they separate that from the justice, so justice of God, so all things are tolerated. But in, in, in God's simplicity, 
both of the all these things work out together to make God who He is. <clears throat> so when He acts, when God moves, and when God does things, <clears throat> He doesn't act solely out of His love, but His justice is in there as well. His mercy is in there. His omnipresence is in there, and His sovereignty is in there. It all works together. And I, I know I didn't list every single piece of of who God is because. I, I believe that we don't know all of who God is. But we know enough. We know enough to come to faith in Christ and to be saved. And we also know enough to live a life in the way that God calls us to live. So we know God has given us everything we need for faith and for practice. He's given us everything that we need to know who He is and know what he wants us to do. <clears throat> so, a seity. A seity. <clears throat> Independent. Or self-existence. <clears throat> he is self-existent. The acidity of God means that God does not need anything outside of himself. Period. For life or anything. <clears throat> if God needed now something outside of himself, then he wouldn't be God. Right. If he needed something outside of who he was, his self-existence, he wouldn't be God. Because God is all-powerful, you know, omnipresent, om omnipotent, all these things. <clears throat> and I think about weird things. <laughs> just put it out there. And, and maybe this isn't weird, but what ha what was going on before the world? Glory. What was God doing? Genesis one one says, "In the beginning, God." I mean, I I mean, I don't know what He was doing. And in reality, it doesn't really matter because God is eternal. He's always been. He always will be. And, and it doesn't really matter what he was doing. But the thing is, is that we as creation is dependent upon God. God is not dependent upon creation. <clears throat> one of the things, and, I, and I, I, know, I know the heart of it, but one of the things that I was told when I was very young in my walk, was that God needed me. That God needed me to accomplish what he wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. I got lied to a lot. That the reason that God saved me was that he needed someone to pour all of his love on. And it makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. But really it's not helpful. Because then you get a picture of God that's not true. It's not helpful to know to to know the wrong things about God. It's not helpful in our lives to know things that are not true. To to believe in all the things that are not true. <clears throat> because when someone needs you and you have the wrong heart, okay? If someone needs you and you have the wrong heart, what that means is you got control now. So in, in an immature believer's mind, <clears throat> an immature people think, okay, God needs me. Huh. That means I got God working for me. Because in order for me to do what he wants me to do, he's first going to have to do what I want him to do. And so it's not real helpful. God doesn't need anyone or anything outside of himself. 
<clears throat> that, 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 is so, that is so much of a truth that God does not need anything outside of himself. <clears throat> God doesn't need you. Those that he saves are those that he has chosen to pour out his love on, those he has chosen to pour out his will on, those he has chosen to use and to save and to glorify one day. But God doesn't need any person to accomplish his will. Think about this. In creation, God said, let there be light. What happened? There was light. God said that there expanse, the firmament, all this stuff, that all this stuff happened, and it was done. He didn't say that there was any of this, any of that. He didn't use anybody in creation. The, the only thing that we know is that everything was made through Christ. By him, for him, through him. That all things were created through Christ. That not one thing was made that was not made through Christ. That's, that's what we know from John 1, 3. <clears throat> God doesn't need the world or anything in the world. The world needs God. There's this thing called common grace. Here's the rabbit. <laughs> common grace. This is the Noahic uh, covenant was a common grace covenant. <clears throat> but what common grace uh, in Proverbs it says that the Lord reigns on the just and the unjust the same. So it does not matter if a believer, if you're a believer or not, you're you're if God wants to grow your crops, he's going to grow your crops in order to fulfill his kingdom. You don't have to be a believer for God to reign, for God to make it rain on your crops. It's common grace. The air that we breathe is the grace of God. We, a lot of times we, don't, we take it for granted. We don't even understand it. But the fact that you are taking a breath. How many of you take it since I said this? grace because if God gave us what we deserved we'd be done we'd be annihilated this earth would be exploded corrupt not corrupt it's already corrupt God doesn't need the creatures but the creatures are dependent upon God and his will working through Psalm 115 3 says our God is in heaven and he does all that he pleases that means that he doesn't take he doesn't need advice from anybody he doesn't need counsel from anybody he does what he knows is to be the right thing to be the best thing to to be his will i'm going to go back to daniel 4 and kenny's probably really excited gone got to daniel twice today <clears throat> daniel 434 <clears throat> oh geez oh, what happened At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, <clears throat> and my reason returned to me. If you guys remember, Nebuchadnezzar uh, <clears throat> was made to live like a cow, basically, for years. And uh, eat grass, all that stuff. So this was at the end of it. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All of the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stand his hand, can say his hand, or say to him, what have you done? <clears throat> At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom. And still more greatness was added to me. Now I, can Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. <clears throat> for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Ouch. Acts 17 24 and 25 says the Lord who made the world and everything in it being the host of heaven being the Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man nor is he served with human hands as though he needed anything since he himself 
gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. <clears throat> Romans 11, 35 and 36 says, Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. God created this world out of nothing. Ex nihilo. That, that's, that's a cool word. Ex nihilo. And it means out of nothing. And when we're talking nothing, we don't we don't we can't even understand the concept of nothing. Because everywhere we are, there's something. But you can be in a black room with no furniture, but there's still something. There's still air. There's still this. There's still that. There was nothing. Out of nothing, God spoke and it came to pass. God spoke and it came to being. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and there was man. God spoke and there was animals. There was God spoke and there was vegetation. Out of nothing. Remember, I think it was in Job, uh, where Job was whining and complaining about God and about all these things. And then God was like, Whoa, who are you? Were you there when I told the oceans, this is as far as you can go? Were you there when I, I, I numbered the sand in the sea or sand on the, on the shore? Were you there? Tell me, man. Were you there? Tell me if you know. Tell me all these things. If you can counsel me, let me know. God basically called him out. And basically he did. And humbled Job right where he stood. Job 38. It was Job 38, right? It's one of my favorites because after chapters and chapters of whining. <laughs> God just says, shut up. Shut up. God created this world and he chooses how he will interact with it and who he will interact with it. All these things are on him. If God has chosen to use you in his kingdom, to him be glory forever. Because it's not for your sake that he did it, it's for his. He does all these things for his glory and for your good. That's the awesome thing is it's not just for, for his selfish glory, but he does these things for your good. Because when God's working in our life, things change. People around us, uh, hearts change, lives change. Things happen. And it's all for his glory. And who are you to answer back to God? Does the clay say to the potter, why did you make me this way? No. Nope. Just is what it is. But God doesn't need anything outside of himself. That, 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 this is really the whole of the, of, of the lesson tonight. God is, in, is simple in the fact that his attributes all work together and he is self-existent where he needs nothing outside of himself or who he is. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we want to thank you for who you are, Lord. We want to thank you for uh, your word. Lord, we want to thank you for your attributes, Lord. I pray that this isn't just dry theology, but that this is something that, that changes hearts, that, that we get to know you more so we can praise you more, so we can glorify you more, and that our lives can change by knowing the truth, Lord. Lord, we thank you for uh, allowing us to come together, Lord. We love you. Please be with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.